Rutherford, uh, Paul Carrick there, Paul Young, uh, they are known collectively by that name, uh, but Over My Shoulder is their brand new single, and it is terrific, as you've heard. Thanks very much, folks, for coming on to the show. Now, my next guest has uh, long been labelled a rebel priest. He certainly deserves that title. He administers within a diocese while operating outside the laws of that diocese. Indeed, he operates outside the laws of the church itself. For instance, he will remarry you in church, even though your previous Catholic marriage has not been annulled by the church. He celebrates mass, he hears confessions, he performs confirmations, even though his faculties to do those things have long been removed by the Catholic hierarchy. The whole dispute began, oh, about 10 years ago and arose specifically with the then Bishop of Down and Connor, now Cardinal Cahal Daly. He's always maintained that he wants a reconciliation with the church, but he also says there's no system of justice to which he or any other priest with a grievance can have recourse. Will you welcome, please, Father Pat Buckley? <laughs> um, do you want a reconciliation? Do I want a reconciliation? Yeah. Well, I think the truthful answer to that, Pat, is that I'm extremely happy uh, doing what I'm doing and in the position I'm in. Uh, I'm helping an awful lot of people every year, and that gives me great fulfillment. I mean, obviously, to help people was one of the reasons I became a priest. But having said that, uh, I'm supposed to be a Christian, and Christians are supposed to be prepared to be reconciled with people that they've become estranged from. Now, Cardinal Daly and I have been estranged uh, for the last eight or nine years, and I suppose if the both of us are Christians, which we should be, then we both have a duty uh, to be reconciled yeah. with each other. It's kind of ironic that we're asking people in Northern Ireland, be they Protestant or Catholic, be they nationalist paramilitary or loyalist paramilitary, we want them to put down their arms, settle their differences. They don't have to like each other, but we want them to live together. And yet we have two very prominent people who can't patch up a row. And they are, you know, the essence of Christianity. Well, I mean, this is a point I've always made that Cardinal Daly, and he has very many good points, and I wouldn't want to take away from those. But for years and years, he's been telling Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland that they have to be reconciled. And recently, he went to Canterbury and said that the Irish and the British had to be reconciled. And yet, unfortunately, he has failed to be reconciled with me. And to, uh, I think that I have given him a, a ample opportunity to do so and will continue to do so. Yeah, but you are operating outside the rules. And I mean, in any club, you know, if you disobey the rules, as uh, Paul Daniels was saying earlier, if you swear on a golf course, out you go. That's mm -hmm. it. End of story. Uh, you are doing the Episcopal version of swearing on the golf course. Right. Well, I mean, people say all of the time to me, you know, if you can't keep the rules, get out of the club. Yeah. Or sometimes people say, well, if you can't, if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. Now, I think it's an awful thing to reduce the church, Christ family, uh, to either a club or a kitchen. We're just a family. We're very diverse. And I think that you can have very different members in one family. And I think one of the ways, perhaps, in which the Catholic Church, apart from the other churches, sometimes fails is that it doesn't, it's not prepared to tolerate diversity. I'm the oldest of 17 children. And in my human family, you can imagine there's huge diversity, and yet we can stay one family. And I think the Church of Christ should be able yeah. to do the same but thing. But the kind of things that you're doing, I mentioned remarrying people <coughs> who have made a mess of their first marriage or they've had a problem with it. Mm. They, ca they haven't achieved a church an annulment, mm -hmm. and you will bring them through um, a religious ceremony, which right. to all casual observers would seem like a, a remarriage within the Catholic Church. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm very glad that you've actually brought this up tonight because I, I'm very uh, happy to have the opportunity to say that as a Catholic and a priest, I believe that marriage should be for life. Yeah. And I think that's the ideal presented by Christ and the Gospel. But unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. So what do you do if people make a mistake? Do you treat them like lepers and punish them forever? Or do you give them a second chance? Now, Jesus always forgave people who had ever committed any kind of sin, murderers, adulterers, all kinds of folk. So we should do the same thing. And what I do is actually in line with the scriptures and with Catholic tradition. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus said, if your partner is unfaithful, yeah, you can be divorced. So therefore, I believe very strongly and can claim that what I'm doing is in line with scripture. Yeah, you may have the imprimatur of, of scripture in this regard, but. Um, Often there may be a, a, a philosophy which uh, can be refined by an institution into mm. a set of rules. That is what has happened in yeah, the but case I think of the Catholic you, Church. If you refine a philosophy like Christ's philosophy and you take it away basically from what he said, then I think that you have to begin to wonder about that. The other thing is, and, and perhaps a lot of your viewers won't be aware of this, uh, if you're a married Catholic 
and if you murder your wife. Uh, the parish priest can give you absolution for the murder and marry you to a new woman the next day. Foolish woman. Well, very foolish woman and woman prepared to take a risk. But if, if, you, if you commit a lesser sin, a mar marriage breakdown, there's no forgiveness. And I think that's a contradiction. Yeah. I also think it's a contradiction that, uh, I mean, I don't think, for instance, that playboys or playgirls who go around ruining people's lives should be married again and again. But if somebody is a victim of somebody else's unfaithfulness, how can we as a Christian church, compassionate people, actually punish the victim for 50 or 60 years? Yeah, but again, I say the rules are the rules are the rules. I mean, uh, if an old lady has her <coughs> house broken into and is mugged, mm. uh, we say we're sorry, but we don't put it to right. No. You know, so, so life sometimes is a bit unfair and people are a bit unlucky maybe in their choice of partner right. but that's the way the cookie has crumbled and what you are doing is you're trying to bake a new cookie for them. Yeah, well I mean I think that Jesus would bake a new cookie for them and he, I mean, he preached about coming to make all things new and I think that it's very important for us to have the ideal of lifelong marriage and that is my ideal. Do you tell the people who come to you looking <coughs> for this remarriage that he doesn't have any uh, status in canon law. Yes, I do. What I tell them is that they're married in the eyes of God, that they're married legally in the eyes of the state because I can legally celebrate marriages both in Northern Ireland and they're in the Republic. But I tell every couple that come to me that they will not be married in the eyes of canon law. But as I always say to them, if you're married in God's eyes and if you're married legally, uh, there's a really matter what a man with a red but hat how, thinks. But how can you be so sure that you're marrying them in the eyes of God? I mean, maybe they'll go on when they <coughs> shuffle off this mortal coil, they find themselves in front of their mm. uh, redeemer <coughs> and he, and let's presume it's a he for the purpose of this argument, mm. says, I'm sorry, you got married twice. You, right. you, you are an adulterer. You yeah, are I a sinner. Yeah. Out in, I mean, how can you be sure that you're doing God's will in this regard? Well, because I, I, but to go back to what I said, I mean, I really have, have gone into this very deeply. And I mean, not only me, but I mean, very famous theologians that are alive at present have studied this whole thing. I'm talking about people like Bernard Herring and Father Theodore Mackin. And what these people keep coming up with is that one, number one, marriage should be for life, but that number yeah. two, there is precedence in scripture and in tradition okay. for people getting a second chance. People will say everybody's out of step except Father Pat. Mm. And it mm. seems to me from what you say that you are protesting against the institutional church and that therefore you are a Protestant. So why not join the <coughs> Protestant Church in, in the way that many Protestants have decided to mm. join the Catholic Church because of the changes of the rules in the Protestant Church right. that they didn't <coughs> like? Well, but there are rules you would like in the <coughs> Protestant Church. In Northern Ireland, where I live now, I'm from Dublin originally, um, people jokingly uh, through the prisons, and Shane O'Doherty has written about this in the big issues this month, call me the Protestant priest. And in one sense, I mean, people might say, well, is that not an insult? But maybe it's a compliment. Uh, because there was an awful lot of things about the Protestant Reformation that were act was actually very good. And of course, that Reformation was very badly handled. And if it had been handled better, the Reformation would have taken place in the church. And we mightn't have had the awful split we've had. So therefore, I think that, uh, I think that it all boils down to uh, the fact, do we tolerate diversity in the church? Yeah. Or do we expect everybody to be robots? Okay, you, you attempted a reconciliation mm -hmm. in 1992. Right. And you composed <coughs> a 15-page document, and I have a copy of it. And you were prepared to make a lot of compromises. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you just tell us the kind of things you were prepared to do, right. and what you were looking for in exchange? Because you, you wanted not necessarily mm. for it to be a one-sided no, agreement. No, no. Well, I mean, what happened was, I mean, I, I had my dispute with Cardinal Daly in 1985-86, and then I was continuing my ministry in Larne, which I do to the present day. And uh, in 1992, the new Bishop of Down and Connor, Bishop Walsh, actually got in touch with me one night through one of his canons. And the canon said to me that the Bishop was in agony about me. And I said to him, there's absolutely no need for the man to be in agony. I can put him out of it in about 20 minutes over a cup of tea, and we can work this out. I had six meetings with the canon, and as a result of that, I presented the Bishop with a 15-page document outlining how the whole thing could be sorted out. I gave the bishop everything he wanted and a few extra things to be generous. What sort of things? Um, well, I, what, basically what he wanted me to do was to stop acting against canon law. And I said that I was quite prepared to bring my activities within canon law. And the three things that I wanted was that, number one, they would accept that they own me, which is a very small thing, because they do. Number that they two, would accept you within the diocese? Yes. Number two, that they would give me some decent work to do, because I'm only 42, and I'm, like yourself, I'm not ready for retirement. And thirdly, 
that, um, that they might show me and guide me as to how I can help the people I'm already helping, but within the system. Yeah. Now, that's not too much to ask for, because uh, uh, you know, there are bishops and priests in countries all over the world actually doing for couples what I'm doing in okay. Lorne. Now, now, you thought that you were making them an offer that they basically could not refuse, and I, I think you invoked, both of you invoked, uh, the prodigal son mm -hmm. parable uh, <coughs> as a way of how this would be reconciled, that yeah. the father and the son both had to accept that this mm -hmm. was to their mutual benefit that the reconciliation should yeah. take place. And the son had to do most of the travelling. But when he got to a certain point and the father spotted him, he ran out and the kind of the reconciliation took place. So I was certainly prepared, and to this day I still am. But practically, what would it have meant? Would it have meant that, number mm. one, you don't do any more of these remarriages? Would you have drawn a, an well, end? No, I think what we would have had to do would be to work out how I could help those people that I'm already helping. Now, they do it in America and in Australia through a thing called the pastoral solution. The parish priest gets a couple to go to a registry office gets married civilly, then he brings them to the church, celebrates a religious marriage, and allows them to return to the sacraments. They're kind of, some very often they're done in secret, but it's called the pastoral solution. Now, if that and kind is this of, okay with the Pope? Well, the, if you talk to bishops and priests in other countries about it, what they say is, what the Pope doesn't know doesn't worry him. And therefore, I think there's, a, there's, there's quite an element of John Paul being kept in the dark about it. And perhaps there's a certain wisdom in that. But it is happening, and I say bishops and priests are doing okay. it worldwide. You, you thought you'd gone most of the road uh, to a solution, but mm -hmm. ultimately that was rejected. Well, I went 95% of the way, <clears throat> and having presented the document, um, the bishop got back in touch with me to say that uh, he was quite happy to take all the concessions I would offer him, but he could give me nothing. Uh, but he did offer me five years' salary in return for five years' public silence. And he said at the end of the five years, uh, he would be very charitable to me. No. Okay, they'd probably give you back a job in some case, but basically you shut up, no writing controversial articles in the yeah. papers, no <laughs> carry on remarrying yeah. people. No they talking to Pat Kenny. Okay, do nothing yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay. That's right. yeah. And you said no. Yeah, I, I said no because I really felt that there was an element of kind of, of bribery in that and an element of trying to silence. Uh, and I, I do believe very strongly, Pat, that the things I think and say and try to do uh, have, a, have, a, have an importance. Uh, and I think that if, if the church isn't going to encourage and allow debate, I think we're going to get okay, into very serious bother. There are a number of things people say about you, that you're a self-publicist, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the kind mm -hmm. of things, you, the very nature of the work that you've undertaken is going to get you notoriety and that right. you enjoy it. Right. Well, I mean, I think that accusation comes from my time in Divis Flats in Belfast when I became involved with the housing and with the joyriders. I mean, and obviously that uh, kind of the, the media kind of descended on what we were doing. And you know yourself as a media person that the media is very hungry for material and gobbles it up. And I mean, when Bishop Daly did remove me, he told me that the two reasons were that number one, I was too socially involved. And secondly, I was guilty of talking to journalists. So I agree with you that from that time, that has been a perception. But yeah. um, I mean, it's a perception. But also you're unsettling. I mean, I can see Cardinal Daly's point of view that if you're allowed to do this and mm. carry on as you do and do all the things that you do, that other priests will start uh, inventing their own agenda. They'll mm. scar the scriptures for justifications for the way they behave. For yeah. instance, there are debates whether the apostles were married or not. Right. If they were, well, there ain't no reason why a bishop can't be married <coughs> or a priest can't be married, no. if that is the case. And St. Paul said a bishop should be the husband of one wife. So, I mean, yeah. so, so what I'm saying is that the church has developed its own set of rules, for good or ill, but they are the rules. Yeah. And you are a turbulent priest, as far as uh, Cardinal Daly is concerned, and he really needs to rid himself of mm -hmm. this thorn in his side. So you've got to come all the way. You've got to get right. back in there and shut up. Yeah. But I mean, that hasn't worked for 10 years. And I think that when people have disputes, I think there has to be a reconciliation. And that always means that both sides have to move a little towards each other. But Bishop Comiskey, as you know, has suggested some sort of a forum <coughs> for priests with yeah. grievances of any kind, mm -hmm. which no doubt a lot of priests would think is a good idea. But at the moment, are there any moves for reconciliation? And this interview is probably going to put the kibosh on them anyway, but right. um, are there moves? Um, well, s since I, I put in this document, um, they offered me the five years paid silence, which I declined. Uh, and then they threatened to set up a church court to put me on trial. And, and I you responded said, by hiring a solicitor to protect you in civil law. Exactly, because I mean, the church court, I mean, you're talking about something that goes back to the Middle Ages. And I mean, I wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell in a church court because it's run by the hierarchy on the basis of canon law. Are you still so living in a church house, one that's owned by the church? Yeah, I, I live in, in what used to be the curate's house in Larne. 
And, and are you sort of squatting in that illegally, or what's the story? No, well, funny enough, last year I had a letter from Bishop Walsh saying that I was now living there with his permission. Oh. So. And you don't pay him any rent or anything like that? No, no. I, I maintain the property, of course. Okay, so yeah. what's the story then? Are there moves afoot to try and bring you back in? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, certainly uh, three years ago there were. Do you want um, to get back in? Um, I, I mean, it would be an awful challenge to me to lose the freedom that I have. Uh, to go back into the very tight system. But what I would say is I'm extremely happy doing what I'm doing, and yet I must be, as a Christian, be prepared uh, to be reconciled with my brother, Cahill Daly, from whom I'm estranged. And the other thing about it is, Pat, he is now 78. He, his successor has been ordained tomorrow, and he retires and will soon be going to his reward. And you would so like quite to urgent. sort it out before then? I think even I mean, if we can't sort out the issues, and even if I can't come back into the system, I think he and I, as two Christian yeah. people, should at least uh, part friends. Do you think you can be accused of the sin of pride? I think everybody can, and I'm sure I can, yes. All right. Father Pat Buckley, thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. okay, Tom.